and welcome to the Bayesian optimization talk, where we will be talking about the fundamentals, how to implement and use uh, Bayesian optimization in practice. Um, we already covered my introduction, I guess, so let's not worry about that here, but you can um, find me on the internet using the links below, uh, especially in the middle. If you go to the GitHub repo, you can find these slides to the talk as well as some other references. Um, so with that, let's get started. Talking about Bayesian optimization or base oft as we usually shorten it to, which is a machine learning technique for optimizing black box functions. So here's the agenda for the next um, 30 minutes. We will first talking about we will first talk about the problem we're trying to solve, what black box optimization is, what motivates us to solve this problem. And then we'll talking we'll be talking about base oft, which is the solution for black box optimization. Since this is by data, we will also talk about how to implement base op in practice using state-of-the-art libraries in Python. And finally, if time permits, we will talk about some slightly specialized scenarios for optimization using base op. Okay, so what is black box optimization? It is an pro optimization problem where we want to optimize for a function, an input, any input output process f of x, that is, we want to find the input x that maximizes the value of f of x. And because of that, we usually call f of x the objective function. Um, there are several challenges to this problem. The first is that, as the name suggests, f of x is a black box. So we cannot really look inside f of x. We don't know what it looks like. We can only get to observe the function values, y equals f of x, at the input that you choose. So you can choose the input x and you get to observe f of x, but you don't actually know the functional form of f of x. The second challenge you might face is evaluating the objective function. So computing f of x is expensive, either in terms of time or money or some other safety critical conditions. This means that you cannot really evaluate f of x for too many times. You only get to evaluate it for a limited number of times. So the goal in black box optimization is to pick, strategically pick out input x to evaluate the objective function with in order to, as quickly as possible, find the global optimum of the objective function. So this is a bit abstract. Let's con consider some examples. Ver a very common example is hyperparameter tuning in machine learning. So a hyperparameter of an ML model is some parameter that um, controls how the model learns or behaves and cannot be learned from data. So some example could be um, the tree death or the number of leaves in a decision tree, or more common nowadays is the architecture of a neural net. So for example, how many layers your neural net has or how many nodes your neural net has, those are hyperparameters. As you can imagine, hyperparameters control um, the behavior of your models. And in black box, in hyperparameter tuning, you want to pick the values for these hyperparameters to best optimize some objective that you have, such as accuracy on some validation test, that validation set. So um, here, the objective function is the validation accuracy, and the input x is the values for these hyperparameters. So again, f of x is a black box, so we don't know how the validation accuracy behaves with respect to the hyperparameters. Otherwise, we would just you know, set, it, set the hyperparameters very easily. But also evaluating the objective function. function. So um, computing the validation accuracy is very time consuming because you would have to retrain the model with different hyperparameters and evaluate it on the validation set. Um, if you're working with a, neural, a very large neural net, that could be very expensive. Another. Um, Example of black box optimization is in product recommendation where a recommendation system tries to find products that a customer is looking for. So the objective function for this recommendation system is the customer's preference and the input for this objective function X is whatever product we can recommend to the user. Again, we don't know the objective function is a black box. We don't know how each customer will react to each uh, product we recommend to them. And also evaluating the objective function is expensive, so we don't want to bombard the user with too many recommendations, right? 
And the goal is to optimize the customer's preference, find the product that the customer likes the most. But black box optimization is not limited to what tech, compa tech companies do either. If you are a scientist, say you might care about scientific discovery, such as drug discovery. Here you want to find the drugs that are most effective against some disease. So here the objective function is effectiveness against the target disease. And the input is the drug that you are experimenting with and synthesizing. Again, objective function is the, a black box. You don't know how effective each drug is until you actually test it out. But that testing uh, process is also expensive. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, scientific equipment and also a lot of money. So again, um, in black box optimization, we want to optimize for some black box objective function, but there are several, several challenges in our way that require, require us to have to pick out intelligent uh, locations to evaluate the objective function with in order to as quickly as possible find the optimum. All right, let's stick with the example of hyperparameter pruning for now. And let's say the, uh, our goal here is in general to find the architecture of the neural, ne or neural network to maximize validation accuracy. So we want to find the number of nodes the network has in order to uh, maximize validation, validation accuracy. And let's, for example, pretend that the ground truth is something like this where the x-axis is the number of nodes you can choose to implement the neural network with, and the accuracy on the validation set uh, behaves like this red curve over here. But remember, in black box optimization, we don't get to know how this objective function behaves. We don't know how the accuracy behaves, so we don't actually get to look at the, uh, the red curve we just saw. Again, what we have to do is to kind of probe around um, within our search space, which is the x-axis, probe around the objective function to find, uh, to learn about the objective function and find the global optimum. Now, this sounds like a pretty common um, task in machine learning engineering. So a popular machine learning library such as scikit-learn should have some pretty good automated solution for us. And it does in the model selection module, you have these different solutions, which basically boil down to two separate strategies. The first is grid search, and the second is random search. So with grid search, you basically uh, divide your search space, the x-axis, into equal segments and then evaluate the objective function at those grid points, right? Um, so here in this specific example, the best point that grid search finds is that point on the right, where the validation accuracy is almost 80%. So it's, it, it, it does okay. But what about random search? Well, because it's random, there's really no way for us to tell how well it does. But here's one example where I basically set the random C to zero and then uh, draw random samples from NumPy. Um, here at random search, does worse than grid search even, achieving the best accuracy of roughly 60%, that's it's not great. And what we might also notice is that it weighs a lot of function evaluations around uh, the left-hand side, which doesn't really give any doesn't give high accuracy. So our takeaway is exactly the title of this slide as well. Uh, naive strategies such as grid search or random search might waste valuable resources that are uh, functional evaluations, resources that we really want to be very frugal about because remember, function evaluations are very expensive. So what we really want to do is to carefully reason about what we know and what we don't know about the objective function from our limited data and then pick out um, the next uh, function evaluation to best find the global optimum, right? And that's exactly what base op does for us. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm showing the result of base off where the number, numbers denote the order in which the function evaluations are made by base off. So it base off chooses the function evaluations that we see here. Um, you can see in the beginning, it kind of spreads out its function evaluations throughout the space, but then quickly narrows down to the region that contains the global optimum. So this is very nice to see. Um, so how does base off exactly do this? Based off um, involves an optimization loop where we start out with a machine learning model that is the Gaussian process that learns from past function evaluations and make predictions about the objective function. 
Now this Gaussian process, the machine learning model has uncertainty quantification, quantification, which is very important for decision making later on. And we will get to this very soon. So don't worry if you don't know what uncertainty quantification is. Anyway, so these predictions will inform our decisions, specifically a decision making policy that will help us find the next point to evaluate the objective function with in order to find the global optimum. So the job of this decision making policy is to generate a score um, that quantifies how valuable each potential new data point is in terms of helping us find the next um, find the global optimum of the function. And we usually visualize the score as this green curve over here. So again, the higher the score is, the more valuable that data point is in terms of helping us find the global optimum. So it's, uh, so our job would be to generate this score with the help of the decision-making policy, and then pick out the data point that has the highest score, which is this star over here, and then evaluate the objective function at that point and um, add that to our training data set that contains all the function evaluations that we have made, and then use this newly updated data set to train the machine learning model at step one and repeat everything all over again until we cannot evaluate uh, the objective functions anymore. So this is the overarching base op loop and we'll be going into the different um, components uh, starting now. So what is the Gaussian process that we use as the predictive model in base opt? And let's pretend that we are working with this specific training data where we have one, two, three, four, five data points that are function observation uh, observations from the objective function. Now we first note that um, common machine learning models such as a decision tree say or a neural net only produce single value predictions. And what do I mean by this? Um, here I'm showing the prediction as the blue curve of a rich regression model trained on the five training data points we see here as black axis. And what we notice again is that it only produces single value predictions in a sense that, oh, if you want to know the prediction at this point 200, then it's just this one number here. If you want to know the prediction at this point 400, it's just this number here. So it's just one single uh, number for each prediction. And because of that, there's no quantification of uncertainty. And by, by quantification of uncertainty, I mean something like this. Let's say we care about how confident we are about the prediction in this region over here between um, two training data points that are very close by to each other here and here. It, intuitively, you should be thinking that um, any prediction in this region should be very certain. We should be certain about these predictions because there's not a lot of wiggle room for the objective function right between these two data points. Well, maybe in this region over here at 200, uh, we should be very uncertain about our prediction just because it's not very close to any of our training data points. So there's a lot of wiggle room for the objective function to change. So we should be very uncertain over here. But again, with this re rich regression model or, in very, or other common ML models, you only have one single number as your prediction. And that's not quite good because again, we want in base off, we want to reason about what we know and what we don't know about the objective function. So there's a need for quantifying our uncertainty. Um, sorry about that. And that's exactly what a Gaussian process does for us. Each, the prediction of a Gaussian process at each data point is a normal distribution. And we usually visualize the predictions uh, like this, where the blue curve is the mean prediction and the shaded region is the arrow bars of the normal distributions. So more, specific, more specifically, right? Let's just consider our prediction at 200 again. At 200, the, um, the mean function, the blue curve, will give us the mean of the normal distribution mu, mu and the boundaries of the shaded region, the arrow bars, will give us two standard roughly two standard deviations away from the mean. And using this mu and this sigma, the mean and the standard deviation, we have a normal distribution representing our prediction at this point, 200. But not just 200, right? We have a normal distribution at every given data point within our search space. 
and each of that each of the predictions is a normal distribution. And what's nice about the normal distribution is that the spread of the distribution quantifies our uncertainty about that prediction. So let's say here in this region, we see that the normal distribution of prediction is very concentrated, which means that we are very certain about our prediction over here. While over here, 200 again, the normal distribution is very spread out. So we are very uncertain in this region, which is exactly what we want. So by using Gaussian process, we get this quantification of uncertainty, which again is very important for decision making because we have to reason about what we know and what we don't know about the objective function. Okay. Speaking of decision making, a key component of decision making is the exploitation exploration trade off. And roughly speaking, you can think of that as sticking to what we know versus taking a risk. So we have to choose between these two actions. Let's consider this example again. Now, looking at um, the training data we have and the predictions made by the Gaussian process, let's try to think about um, what, where we should evaluate the objective function next in order to optimize it, right? Well, you might think we, you want to focus on this region because um, our prediction at that region is very high. It gives high value. And that would correspond to exploitation. We are exploiting the, our knowledge about the, the objective function to optimize it. Well, but you might also say, hey, around these regions, we don't know too much about the objective function. Our uncertainty is high. So we, we might want to explore these regions corresponding to exploration. We might want to explore these regions to learn about the objective function more. Well, in this specific example, it's quite clear to us that exploitation is what we want to do because we can look at the object, the real ground truth of objective function. But that's not always the case. In another scenario, if our training data set is something like this, then exploitation would be corresponding to currently um, evaluating the objective function around this region, which can get us stuck to this local optimum. So it's actually not the best optimum, right? The best optimum is over here. Well, exploration on the other hand will help you learn about the, the objective function more and hopefully um, uncover the true global optimum. So a very, an intelligent balance between exploitation and exploration is key to decision making, is key to any base of policy that we design. And I usually think of this trade-off as ordering from a restaurant where exploitation right, would, be, um, would be ordering something that you know you would like. Well, exploration would co be corresponding to ordering something that you don't know anything about. And the goal is still to find the item that you like best from this menu, but you have to balance between uh, sticking to what you know and taking a risk again. Okay, so how does a base up policy actually do this? It, and we will be sticking to this um, example throughout. So with a base up policy, you have to use a decision-making heuristic. And one heuristic could be to pick the input x that will improve from the best point that we have seen so far the most. In this training set, the point that you, the best point that we have seen so far is this point over here that gives the highest objective value that we have seen throughout. And that corresponds to this dotted line. So that this dotted line is f star, as we are denoting here. We want, again, to maximize the improvement that we will have by, uh, by evaluating f of x for some x from f star, right? So we want to maximize this quantity here that quantifies the improvement. And that corresponds to the uh, green shaded region. Now the problem is always we don't know f of x is, so um, we don't we don't get to decide we, we don't get to decide which one will give us the most possible improvement. But from the Gaussian process, we know that each f of x follows a normal distribution, and because the normal distribution is a very nice mathematical object. It allows us to compute the average value of this improvement quantity over here according to the normal distribution. So this is the expected value of this quantity. We usually call it the expected improvement quantity. And this expected improvement quantity is the score that we will use to basically rank the different data points that we can use as input to evaluate the objective function next to, um, to find the global optimum. So once again, this score um, quantifies how valuable each 
data point is in the search for the global optimum. And this score balances between exploitation and exploration as well. If, um, if a data point has a very large prediction mean, then it will also in, it will increase the expected improvement score and that will correspond to exploitation like this region over here. If a point has a very large standard deviation, so high uncertainty, that will also increase our uh, expected improvement score corresponding to these regions over here, exploration. So this policy, this expected improvement score balances between exploitation and exploration, just like we like to be. And once again, what we would want to do is to pick out the data point that has the highest score. And that would be the point that we choose to evaluate the objective function next. And that will complete one iteration of the Bayesian optimization loop. Sorry again. Um, but remember, in the loop, we would repeat everything all over again until we run out of function evaluations, right? So here I'm showing an animation showing the evolution of base of uh, that we saw in the beginning, where it sequentially picks out the next point to query the objective function next using the expected improvement score that we just saw. Um, uh, several things um, we can notice from this. First, this policy leverages past observations to inform future decisions. And by doing that, it doesn't get stuck at a local optimum over here which is exactly what we want. But it also doesn't explore low performing regions either. So it kind of ignores this region over here where the accuracy is low. So that's also very nice. And because of that, we are able to converge to a global optimum easily. So based off is very successful in this specific task. Um, but remember, seeking to improve from the best point that we have seen so far is only a heuristic. And by choosing different optimization heuristics, we can obtain different base R policies, different ways of making decisions. Um, very popular heuristics are drawn from the multi arm bandit problem from reinforcement learning. The, uh, one of them is the upper confidence bound on UCB policy. And this one basically you, in this one, you basically use the um, upper region of the error bar in your prediction as the score that quantifies how valuable your data points are. So this green curve on the bottom is matches exactly with the screen curve at the top, um, which is one way to make decisions, right? Another um, way to make decisions is Thompson sampling, which involves drawing samples from the Gaussian process. People consider a Gaussian process as a distribution over functions. And because it's a distribution, you can draw samples from it. And you, for each sample, you pick out the data point that maximizes that sample. And that will be the next point that you use to evaluate the objective function with. All right, another way to make decisions is to leverage information theory. And that would be to um, minimize your uncertainty about the location of the objective function, the, the location of the global optimum of the objective function. And that will correspond to, correspond to entropy search policies. And each of the policies we just talked about balances between exploitation and exploration in its own way. But unfortunately, there's no one size fits all policy that will work well across all problems. So it requires a little bit of trial and error to find which policy works well in your problem. All right, so that is the background for base off. Let me just quickly mention some success stories for base off. Um, I've mentioned hyperparameter tuning. There's a study, um, there's a study, research study that found that base op is very successful at um, hyperparameter tuning. So they have conclusive evidence for this, which is nice to see. You can also use base op again for scientific discovery, just as to, such as to discover enzymes or molecules, which I think is quite cool. All right, so that is base op. How can we implement base op using Python? Luckily for us, there's a cohesive software ecosystem that we can use that starts with PyTorch for tensor manipulation, ePyTorch to implement Gaussian processes, so that predictive machine learning model we use, and finally, BoTorch for implementing base op policies. Now, with ePyTorch to implement Gaussian processes, you basically need two components. The first is a mean function, and the second is kernel. I'm going to cross over some details over here because I think I'm running out of time. But based, um, GPyTorch makes it very easy to implement a Gaussian process model. And the API almost resembles the API to implement a neural net in PyTorch. So if you have some experience working with uh, PyTorch, 
GPyTorch could be uh, very easy to do. And GPyTorch, um, it offers a wide range of mean functions and kernels. So by combining different mean functions and kernels, you can um, model a wide range of um, patterns, wide range of behaviors for your objective function. All right, what about Botosh? Botosh is used to implement based our policies. And because it's very modular, sometimes changing the policy that we are using uh, is equivalent to just replacing one line of code most of the time. So let's let's say you want to use expected improvement, then you can you can just use this line of code to implement the policy. If you want to use UCB instead, you could simply swap out that line of code for this line of code. Very easy to do. Thompson sampling is a little bit more complicated, but once again, Botosh makes it, makes it very easy to do. All right. Um, there are specialized settings in the real world where you um, don't have that very simple structure of evaluating the objective function one specific location and then add that to your training data and repeat. Sometimes you have more specialized scenarios. For example, but in batch optimization, you might be able to make multiple evaluations at the same time. Um, this is very common in hyperparameter tuning, right? You might be able to train multiple models on a cluster of TPUs, say, so you are able to make multiple evaluations at the same time. You might have constraint optimization, where you have to satisfy some constraints while optimizing for your objective function. This is common in product recommendation, where you want to present products to a user while keeping the cost of that product below some th threshold. So you don't want to suggest very expensive items to your user. Multi-objective function optimization is also very popular, where you have to contend with multiple potentially competing objectives. One example I like to use is in hyperparameter tuning again, where not only you want to optimize for accuracy on a validation set, but you might want to optimize for also training time, the size of the model. So you want to keep the model small so that it's efficient to run. Luckily for us, BaseOff is, is able to handle all of these different scenarios, but we won't be going to that here. All right, so as a last note, I want to mention that I've been working on this book called Bayesian Optimization in Action with Many, and it's basically a um, more detailed version of this talk where I, I try to use a lot of plots to visualize different mathematical op, um, concepts. Um, in this book, which I think would help with the learning process. You are PyData, so you can use this code or the QR code below to obtain a 35% discount code for any Manning books, including mine. And you can also contact me uh, for a free ebook copy, um, which I have three uses. Alrighty, thanks for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Perhaps we're running low on time, so we can move the conversation to, to Discord.